As, as chairman, I will take the uh, uh, advantage of asking you the first question. Uh, but you talked a lot about the role of state. Uh, you talked about what bad states are, weak states, states that uh, perhaps uh, are too resource rich or whatever, have no infrastructure or whatever. You didn't actually define very well what a good state is. Uh, it was, so maybe as an introduction, how would you define a good state to uh, control the externalities of, of uh, capitalism? So in a few, great question, Arno. Um, in a few words, I'd say that a good state is one that is attentive to the full range of its people. So it would be judged by that breadth of concern rather than sectionalism. That has appropriate feedback mechanisms to hear from and give voice to the full range of people um, in the state that uh, shares burdens relatively equitably and that, but I say equitably, not equally, mm -hmm. consistently, and that um, builds relationships with the key institutions in society to sustain them, that is interested in and sustaining of institutions. So it's active, but not taking a monopolist role that all institutions must be state institutions. Um, I look at the audience. Uh, if you can introduce yourself uh, and preferably use a microphone, uh, Steve. Uh, there are micro ro ro roving microphones. I we all have this program. And some thoughtful person, right at the beginning of the program, right under the topic of your talk, capitalism, externalities, and social institutions, and there's a you know title or sentence, and then Hayes. Something about the Hayes. You Hayes. haven't seen this. Yet. I haven't yes. seen this. Yeah. Oh, here Hayes. we go, right here. In the natural state of capitalism, where corporations' main aim is to maximize profits, da, 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 da. And it then goes here, the prolonged spell of haze this year has been blanketed and affected much of Southeast Asian, da, 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 da. All right. So right Well, here, um, okay, I know so, about the prolonged so, spell of haze, so we can uh, go to this. So what I'm saying is we, we understand your basic principles, powerful but abstract principles. Yep. And we all have walked out the window and breathed the haze. Yeah. Not today. Right. Happily, you, in November, it's receded, right? Could you link these two yeah, things? Yeah, sure. So the, without being much of an atmospheric scientist to look at the haze in this, the, we have, and I, I mentioned it in the talk, a couple of things going on. So we have um, the accumulation of particulates in the air in general. Um, which, with some exacerbations from uh, uh, broad air current issues that are linked to climate change, and thus linked to a lot of different kinds of influences, with uh, a pattern of burning um, in Indonesia uh, to uh, clear land and be part of uh, the, the uh, palmol industry. Uh, the, so we have a capitalist industry that is engaged in this, we have the margins of large capital, as a lot of this has been done by small um, uh, businessmen at the perimeter of the big estates because they actually don't control the big estates and therefore they're using, as is often the case, the more extreme technique precisely because they don't control the most lucrative potential in the industry. Um, and so, we, but we have a classic externality of capitalism. It's not their goal. Their profit is not increased by producing your haze. Um, it is entirely a byproduct of something that they are doing to secure their profit in this, for which they are not paying the costs. Um, and the they here would take an analysis that I can't produce. I mean, to what extent is this large capitalist? To what extent are they Indonesian, or they're Malaysian, or they're wherever they're from? Um, who own and operate, and what liability they have, what is it, how much is it, as I understand is the case, not the large capitalists who have actually tried to adopt a stand against this, um, but a variety of smaller ones at the margins, the enterprise, what does the state do? So it can mitigate, right? There could be action that hasn't been very effective to stop this practice. Um, it could compensate. 
that's hard. And by compensation, I don't just mean financial compensation. I mean things like try to work to figure out how to limit the effects. I don't know what's possible atmospherically. But that would be a connection from my point of view. In this case, it's a clearly undesirable um, externality. The whole practice, right, clearing the land by fires, producing the haze, is undesirable as a way of, of managing and working in this industry. It's different, therefore, from, say, technologically based unemployment, where the new technology might actually be desirable, but the unemployment undesirable. Did that answer yeah, the question? But there is something to uh, Steve's question. Steve Miller is our dean of our School of Information Systems. But there is something to Steve's question about the fact that you can't solve the haze problem with a state because it is crossing borders. It's true. And I think that that's often the case. So I think the Indonesian state probably could do more than it's doing in this particular case, but I don't want to get into that because yeah, I don't have no. the information to adjudicate. It takes states often to create interstate solutions. And what I would suggest is that the notion that we can get um, effective non-state transnational cooperation to solve these kinds of problems seems to me at least rarely going to be the case. It, okay. it actually takes the effective states. So does the formation of ASEAN and the potential economic community create potential additional incentives for interstate cooperation among the key states that are involved in this case? Um, perhaps, and I would hope so. But I, I completely agree, and, and I didn't make clear that I think the, it's not that states can do all of this. It's that states are important for a lot of it, but also that states can only be effective if they give up the idea that they can do it all on their own. So I, I don't think I was clear enough in saying that. I know it's in the notes because I wrote it at 2 in the morning on the airplane. Um, the, the, uh, there is a tendency to imagine effective state power as autonomous state power. And I think that in the world of global capitalism and financially linked capitalism, effective state power is the power to, to manage non-autonomy well, um, not the ability to secure complete autonomy. And this goes to international cooperation in this arena, but the importance of the various uh, institutions of international cooperation dealing with systemic risk and finance, or the capacity to manage um, issues of migration, if that's only managed by states trying to secure their borders and not by some broader international cooperation, it's going to be a problem. I had a question there in the middle, and then I have two people waiting there, and I see lots of hands. So uh, keep your questions short. I'll keep my answer short, too. Yeah. Hi. Uh, does it work? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Thais. I work here in Singapore. I'm French, and I graduate from LSE. Yay! So I shaked your hand maybe two years ago for when I got my graduation. Um, I had a question about what you mentioned about the COP21 is coming, right? And yesterday, the French, I think 39 French companies published uh, their commitment into um, more low carbon initiatives with actual numbers and everything. There's been a lot of debate right now if the COP21 is going to reach a binding agreement. So coming up to what you said, the governments kind of need the firms. How do you see that coming? With like the firms committing, the governments having trouble to commit because they're dependent. Yeah. That's my yeah. question. Great question. Unfortunately, I think you summed up the answer. Um, <laughs> I find the, a range of firms um, committing. They have somewhat different interests in this than the governments, which have to balance lots of different actors and political contingencies and are subject to elections and things like that. Um, but in general, the governments have been f at best cautious in regard. The binding agreement is likely to be achieved only by settling for a level of reduction that is inadequate, like 1.5% instead of two and so forth. Um, and so already there will be the production of something that is, has the illusion of being adequate that's not adequate um, in this. I don't think it's the case that, in general, global corporate capitalism has signed up enthusiastically to um, carbon reduction. I think it is that there is an advantage um, for many, and, and it's seized, to be among those who lead in this. Um, so, yeah. I take one question there. Uh, I teach uh, sociology at the uh, US. Um, so uh, thank you for the very enlightening, um, very enlightening uh, talk. Um, 
I guess my, so my question sort of continues on this, um, on this concern with the corporate sector. Um, so I'm thinking of um, Mark, um, Ms. Ruxi's um, book about the fra fracturing of American pro corporate elites. Um, and one of the arguments that you have probably very familiar with is that you know, it's precisely because the fracturing of uh, corporate elites that makes this any, any um, sort of pact with the, between, between the business, the, the state, and the civil society very difficult today. And, and it's making worse um, with the globalization of, uh, of capitalism. Um, so I wonder if you, you see any possibility of, of, of any finding any way out of this, and what would that be, or what the state has to sort of take the initiative? Yeah. Rather than I'd actually, the state can't take all the initiatives, so this would be, have to be something that the states could change incentives and, and have a role. I think the, the first, I, I generally agree with this Mizroki analysis and your summary of it. So the the fracturing of the corporate elite so that it cannot create an effective solidarity group is destabilizing. I don't think that's true everywhere in the same degree it's true in the United States. And so in most debates on capitalism, I think um, we have to look not just at examples like the US, Britain, and continental Europe, but at um, several Asian economies that look pretty different, including on this indicator. Um, in which you have levels of cooperation and you have kinds of business organization that are different. And um, I think, therefore, potentially different futures. You also have different kinds of state business relationships. And so if we say that capitalism has several different possible future trajectories, I don't see a very easy path by which the US gets to the kind of state private sector mm -hmm cooperative arrangement that I've said might be helpful. I see better chances for that, um, and I see already existing starts here and elsewhere. Uh, yes, I will take your question, and then I'll come back to you. Professor Kham, uh, I'm T.H. Chien, I'm from former private sectors. You are very familiar with the American environment. So my question is that Donald Trump is a symbol of the capitalism. Should he win the election in America, how do you see the, the link between the state and the capitalism and its impact on the countries outside US? Yeah. Right, so your last sentence deprives me of being able to answer, well, there's a reason I moved to England. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, Donald Trump is a symbol of capitalism, but he's not a very typical capitalist. And I think one of the interesting things about him is that in this sort of populist movement that supports Trump, it matters that he's a rich, a celebrity rich guy. It doesn't matter very much what kind of businessman he is or was and, and how that works. As um, were he to become president, I think it would be um, really interesting, but um, the the unpredictability of policy would have destabilizing impact on global cooperation and therefore ability to deal with a whole range of the kind of issues that I was talking about. Um, in addition to the fact that in many cases he wouldn't want necessarily to deal with them very positively in the US. But I guess that actually a lot of what he talks about is also dealing with externalities. Like migration, but, uh, yeah. but in a very different way than most people would expect. So yeah. he doesn't, uh, I, would, I don't defend him at all, by the way, but, uh, uh, but he doesn't shy away from the externalities created by capitalism. No, not at all. Yeah. I had a, que a second question there, and then I, I will look. Yeah. So, um, my name is Joe I'm a sociologist at SMU. And you, know, you said you know, firms matter, states matter, nations matter, and so forth. So do you think higher education institutions matter in this? You know, as a sociologist and director of LSE, <laughs> what do you think of the role of you know, higher education in this okay. uh, capitalist so, system? Thanks, Hiro, good question. And I have read your advisor's recent book. Um, the, um, the, I'm less optimistic than Michael Kennedy is in his recent book about the capacity of universities in this and the, the direction. So I think universities are extremely important institutions. And so when I talk about social institutions, they are among them, along with some others. But they are among the pivotal social institutions, potentially, to do this. Universities also face uh, 
external competitive pressures of the same kind I've talking about. They're mostly not for profit. It's not the same kind of capital market pressure, but investment pressure, efforts to secure donations, and other things. I think um, make the level of innovation needed hard. I think that some, and an elite of universities, will achieve some of this, uh, but that the, the extent to which it would, the amount of innovation it would take to, to make the higher education sector a really high performing um, source of help in this would be large. I think that knowledge inputs, on the other hand, are considerable and understanding better the way in which uh, some of these issues work will enable better policies and so forth. Um, I'll take the second to say, I think that, that a shakeout is coming in the university sector and we can already see some of the seeds of the transformation but not all of where everything goes and that there will be universities that are relatively insulated from this, either because of strong state support or because of their own independent standing, but that it's gonna take a lot of creativity to figure out new institutional structures and new methods of financing for the, the big middle of the higher education system to be able to work well in this context. I'll take a, a question there and then take a question. Uh, researcher here at SMU in the business school. Um, one of the things you haven't really mentioned yet is uh, the favorite thing of capitalism, money. Um, so at the moment there is a big change going on in the meaning of money with cryptocurrencies, with lots of other things happening, and also the disaggregation of the different functions that money has, has and then the role of the state with regards to issuing money. It's all kind of changing. So how does that relate to the power of the state when it comes to fiscal and monetary policy, for instance? Okay, um, good questions that I'm gonna have to really answer in a very truncated way. A, because I don't know the complicated, sophisticated answers, but B, because trying to say what I do know would take too long. Money is a, a big and complicated topic, and you start with to what extent do you mean um, currencies and alternatives to currencies? To what extent do you count all of the um, uh, money that is contained in debt and, and and recorded debt, and how far do you go into the cryptocurrencies and the alternative currencies to do this, in which there are lots and lots of different kinds of money in the world floating around now, and it's exploding. The um, move to fiat currency um, by the US government in the early 1970s is one of the trail of things that leads into this, and there are other directly monetary bits of the trail to the financial crisis and to the predicament we try to get out of, um, including the development of SDRs and all of the, the sort of international apparatus of official money. But a big part of this is the overlap with illicit capitalism that I talked about. So it's both perfectly legal cryptocurrencies, things that aren't currencies but are simply media of exchange, but it's also the, the growing difficulty of keeping track of money that frustrates policymakers. So there are a variety of different um, measures of money in the system in every economy, and people are looking at them and tracking them. But there's also some considerable failure and, and known failure. It's one of those known unknowns. How, what is the gap between the money that can be measured by the Federal Reserve Bank, say, in the US, and the actual flow of money and money-like Activity. So I think it's a big issue. I'll conclude my, my you know, very short truncation by saying the ability, whatever the merits of a very money-driven um, financial management approach, the ability to run one has been undermined pretty severely yeah. by change. Well, actually, a few years ago, we had in the same uh, chair here, uh, Paul Krugman. And oh, he, he knows was, more about that than Yeah, I do. and he was sort of making the point about, uh, I mean, he was talking about, is the financial, was the financial crisis unavoidable? And his statement, and I simplify it like extremely here, but his statement was, um, it was, it is not avoid, unavoidable, it was unavoidable because you start with a regulated system and then people start to try to escape the regulations. Yeah. And, states are not able to keep up with the That's creativity right. of the people who try to escape the regulation. And if, if you reach an, a certain level of uncontrolled financial right. activities, then you get a financial crisis. I, I, I simplify yeah. extremely no, well, I think, but yeah. the real question is, 
that, that then for me is you, you depict a picture whereby you say capitalism needs um, the state to um, control or to, to manage uh, the externalities, but is the state actually having the capacity to keep up with the creativity of ca capitalism? No, and of course neither does the top management of most firm. I mean, there's a sort of issue <laughs> here in a serious way, right? One of the problems in the financial crisis is that top managers um, were not able to keep up with what their traders were doing in investment banks. And um, so that you had traders pursuing risk strategies that were not approved either by the people in charge of risk compliance and so forth or by the top management. You had um, a kind of mathematization of trading that demanded skills that many of the top management didn't have yet. You know, so there were siloing, right? So that's a problem. The unknowability, one of the issues, the sheer complexity of the unknowability then you add the lack of transparency. So there wasn't very much transparency-oriented um, regulation. The extent to which there's the escapes from regulation, but there's also the simple um, states didn't catch up and regulate new things. Mm -hmm. So hedge funds just hadn't been brought in in any sense, and they are sort of defined by being not regulated in that sense. So I, I think that the complexity is a huge factor. I'm, without being qualified, I don't have a Nobel Prize in economics, <laughs> where I would uh, quibble with Krugman about it is unavoidable starting when. Yeah. And um, the unavoidable, you know, could it have been solved, you know, was there something to do in 2006 that was an available tool to policymakers to prevent the meltdown that started in 2007? He's probably right, no. But is there a meaningful history in which some tangible decisions are made that lead to it, particularly from, or about a, from the 70s forward? Yes, and there are things that could have either avoided or mitigated or um, uh, in other ways changed the outcomes. Yeah, I'll take another question. In the back there, the person with the, I can't see you, but uh, so maybe if you can stand up while you ask the question. Uh, my name is Peter Douglas from the Chartered Alternative Investment Analysts Association. And a, and a former student of Professor De Meyer. Um, you, you made a almost throwaway comment uh, midway through your presentation about uh, uh, professions turning into businesses. And you could argue, I think, with some justification that the professions provide the intellectual backbone of capitalism, the, the lawyers, the accountants, the fiduciary professionals, the, back, the bankers. What, what are your thoughts about the corporatiz corporatization of that intellectual backbone? I accept the intellectual background proposition. I think the, the um, reorganization of professional services um, has undermined some of the capacity to um, provide the benefits of that, um, not eliminated it. So there are still learned professions. The way in which um, law firms, accountancy firms, a whole variety have been reorganized sometimes corporatization, sometimes still using partnership structures, but on a massive scale. Um, but in all cases, redefining their business models, and in many cases, um, reducing the independence of the professionals um, who become employees in a much, in a firm organized in a different way, I think reduces some of the, the uh, way in which professionals could make the contributions that they've made. And it's not dissimilar to what's happened in universities. I think universities are also in a way like professional services firms that haven't yet had the kinds of reorganization that law firms, accountancy firms, and so forth have had. Um, may not want it, but may not figure out exactly how to escape it. The other person that stood up. Uh... <coughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. That was a very, very erudite lecture. I just wanted to ask you uh, something parallel to financialization. This is about digitalization or data, as valuable as money or more. And you mentioned that institutions, then firms, society, and the state, and how the benefits and costs and the externalities and how it will be allocated. So is there something that is being done? I know it's being done, but uh, is there something that you can draw parallel with what you said? 
but for data rather than money. So there are parallels and there are dissimilars. I mean, in one sense, the earlier question about money is based on the extent to which money has become data um, and not anything reducible to the gold standard or any other kind of external standard. So in some sense, money is a subset of the data um, issue. And the data um, flows everywhere. A conclusion widely drawn is that there is a fundamental incompatibility between market capitalist structures and information society and the ubiquity of data. Um, I'm not convinced. Uh, this is a, a core theme in the recent book, Post Capitalism and some other kind of things. Manuel Castells thinks this of this. I don't see why there's a fundamental incompatibility and what I see is an awful lot of propri proprietary control of data and state control of data and yes, indeed, there is data that escapes that, but I think that the extent of the, um, the two forms of control is very substantial. Um, so I would come closer to some like um, Evgeny uh, Morozov in the net delusion in saying that we are misled by the ways in which we relate to both data and sort of informatics more generally to think that that is the whole of the world of informatics, that it's really a lot like professors using email and professors doing research only on a bigger scale, and it's not. It is intensively organized by structures of uh, power and um, property and wealth um, and, uh, um, and should be thought of that way. So on its own, it's not going to liberate us. Um, it could be used in very different ways, positively or negatively. And there are a whole series of externality points about that from data theft to um, uh, others. I'll take one question there. Please keep Hi. it short. Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Craig Calhoun. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Wong. I'm a member of People's Association and a banking and finance uh, graduate University of London. Uh, I cite two examples, Titans, uh, businessman, the steel man, Andrew Carnegie, and Microsoft, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Philanthropy Foundation. Uh, it's a uh, laser fair, the strong helping the weak, the wealthy, uh, assisting the needy. Uh, in Singapore, we have a scholarship uh, from primary to university. So uh, how would you propose uh, we help the, uh, identify the uh, correct uh, people to help and also Warren Buffett, uh, World Wealth, Second Wealthiest, mentioned and state tax for the wealthy to uh, pay the government uh, expenses. What do you think of the Warren Buffett statement? Thank you. Right. Thanks. So I'll, I'll take a, a core part out of that in order to be brief. I think philanthropy has a large and growing role to play. I think it's an interestingly understudied and poorly studied a branch of activity from social science, management, economics areas that we, ha we don't know enough about how philanthropy works. We don't know enough about how to make it work better. That is, uh, a lot of philanthropy is organized by good intentions without strong capability to ensure effectiveness. Um, the, uh, but the very inequality of the world and the extent of large fortunes is helping to bring an increase in philanthropy, changes in philanthropy. It's not um, all gifts by people late in their lives seeking immortality. It's often gifts by people who've gone through an IPO at 36 and are seeking to play a leading role in engaging it. We need to be looking at that. Um, it's going to matter, and it's been disproportionately associated with the US and um, others have emulated. So Singapore has used tax credits and tax breaks, um, including during this anniversary year to, to promote more philanthropy. Singapore's government has had a very self-conscious policy of trying to encourage philanthropic giving, um, and I think it's been an effective policy and is a good model in this. I think China is, for example, deeply divided about whether it wants to do roughly the same thing. How can it channel philanthropy into socially useful um, purposes and, and support people in doing it? Or should it clamp down on this because of the extent to which it empowers individuals to make the choices um, in quasi-public arenas? I'll take one last question over there. Hi, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, I'm Sam, I'm a professor of sociology at Nanyang Technological University. I wanted to just ask you to say more about nations and how do you create national identity without populism? Okay. So we got a three university sociologist here, right? That's and sorry. You sorry. And you and Terrific. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Um, proudly. The, uh, so 
national identity is a, a particular question in Singapore because it's about creating, in exactly what you said, and developing a national identity in a relatively new um, context where the state um, was created not on the basis of a claim to an ancient pre-existing identity. So the, the threats of populism and some of the other issues are different where the, the nation state is a claim to we've always been there and have this right, um, even if it's a new state. The, um, I think that the continued reinvention of identity is an interesting question. I have, I have not a, a crisp answer to this, but Singapore is doing it in everything from building institutions like museums, um, so the way that there's the celebration of the anniversary year, creating higher education, with, but creating it with a, um, a set of, if you will, promotional messages about why it's important um, mm -hmm. that um, are, are there. So we can say, ooh, that's a little bit too promotional sometimes for taste or something, but that's a, a plausible approach. High, national identity of a non-populist kind has often been created by um, the development of a um, thriving elite culture. Um, so um, in areas from art to science to academia and so forth, but this an elite culture which then is more widely um, disseminated. That's uncomfortably elitist for many, um, and the other side of that is trying to claim the popular culture, the already there culture, which I think doesn't work very well in this context. In the cases where there's a pre-existing identity, it works better, but also popular culture is, um, I think, not quite so national um, in, in many ways, so that, that a lot of, of uh, it's a, a corporate presentation of you know, pop music or whatever in many settings. But the, um, the trick will be, I think, the building the connection. You know, can, the, can the cosmos and the heartlanders in Singapore um, really build a sense of inhabiting the same um, project here. Um, and th that's got a lot to do with whether this really seems to work in a fair way um, across the two groups. But I think national identity is a chicken and egg question in this, because if there's to be a promotion of opportunities for those less well off or less privileged or less successful in their secondary school exams or anything like that, it requires a buy-in um, that I think is what nationalism at its best delivers. I have one last question. Yeah. Given the fact that the premise of this one here is that capitalism is the system that seems to work and we need to control, check for the externalities, do you see in the world any, I wouldn't say credible, but serious alternative to capitalism? No, and that's this. So I actually, capitalism sort of works, is going to be my answer. I would not say, oh, capitalism works so fantastically that this is our dream. What I would say is there's no credible alternative, and all likely transitions out of capitalism look really bad. So there's a, a version of thinking about a potential collapse of capitalism. The next crisis, it will collapse. And what I would put to you is, what would happen if it collapsed? anything good, and it wouldn't collapse like a state, like, like the Soviet Union collapsed, and then you had Russia and various other states. That was a legal structure that collapsed. It would be more like the collapse of the Roman Empire, the collapse of feudalism, which took 300 years of really pretty dismal life to collapse, um, that the, a sort of long-term transformation of that kind would be filled with wars and conflicts, diseases, hunger, would not look good. So efforts to, to fix and change capitalism seem to me to make a lot more sense. Um, I think the audience will join me in thanking you for what is a masterly lecture. Thank you. Thanks for good questions. <laughs>